So we'll start with Refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange churam soge churam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penchia sange drupa show sange churam soge churam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi Rola penje sange jupa sho sange churan sogi chonam la chanchu padu dane kapsu chi dagi chunyangi pe sonam ki rola penje sange jupa sho. Repeating that once more to yourself, letting it reconnect. Okay. So today the plan is that we'll finish going through the 35 Buddhas and the Medicine Buddhas and then uh, do some Vajrasattva practice this session. And then after lunch, I'm going to do more public talk, uh, Dharma talk style to talk about some details to do with Vajrasattva practice purification in general. And I'm going to move to the Gompa so that some of the Vajrapani staff can join us. So there'll be a brief change of venue after lunch, but otherwise uh, you guys don't have to worry about it. But in case you're wondering why suddenly the background is more impressive, that's why. Um, and then um, the then the session after that, we'll go into some more Vajrasattva details and I'll have time to have questions with you guys then because in the Gompa, it's sometimes a little bit more awkward with Q&A. So this session, um, we're going to finish up 35 Buddhas. And if you had... Um, hanging doubts or stuff that was brewing overnight, um, please do ask any of those. So um, we'll go ahead and start, but please do interrupt if you were reminded of something you wanted to ask. So here's the image that we've been looking at. And as I mentioned yesterday, there are many accurate, correct images of the 35 Buddhas. This particular organization is just, I think, the easiest, and it's also the most commonly used in the FPMT in our organization. So at the heart of Thousand Arm Chenrezig is this syllable Hri, and Chenrezig is there right at the very center of Shakyamuni Buddha. Beams of light are emitted from the Hri, forming five rows in the space below. At the end of each of the 34 beams is a throne supported by elephants and adorned with pearls. And on each throne is seated one of the 35 Buddhas. If you like, you can also visualize a row of seven medicine Buddhas below the 35 Buddhas and prostrate to them as well. And that's indicated here. And in case you were wondering at the very bottom, all of these white ladies, these are offering goddesses. <clears throat> so they're making offerings to the 35 Buddhas. So then we think that each one of these Buddhas is the embodiment of all the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, all the statues, scriptures, stupas of the three times and 10 directions, whose essence is the guru. So that teacherness that speaks to your own wisdom and helps it develop. <clears throat> that outside divine, which then meets your inside Buddha nature and helps stimulate its growth and helps stimulate transformation as well as clears all the obstacles. So we have complete faith that each one has the power to purify all your negative karma and imprints collected from beginningless time. And when we prostrate, if you have the mental space for it, you can then imagine you emanate numberless bodies as you prostrate. And all these bodies in all directions covering every atom of the earth prostrate along with you. And then before you start the actual prostrations and saying the names of the 35 Buddhas, we increase the merit by taking refuge. So there's some options for um, adding more elaboration, but it might be too soon if you're new to this practice. But when you imagine that you emanate numberless bodies, it's like your own body replicates and replicates and replicates, and all of you prostrating together, it symbolizes and helps develop the merit for all of your past lives and all of their mistakes. So that is a really excellent way of increasing the impact. But if it's too soon to kind of expand the visualization of yourself, because you're just trying to get used to the visualization in front, don't worry about it. 
So we're in the fifth row, the last row. And this green row are all in the aspect of Amoga City, head of the karma family or action family. And they purify the compositional factors aggregate and jealousy, and then develop swift wisdom or all-encompassing wisdom, <clears throat> all-encompassing. Uh, yeah, anyway, there's a few different translations for swift wisdom, but it's that quick one. And the first one is King holding the victory banner of foremost power, which purifies having caused other sentient beings to collect negative karma and the negative karma you have collected by slandering others. So the preliminary practice of prostrations, this is a, a booklet that you can find in your Dropbox or on the FPMT website, says that the negative karma collected through pride and jealousy is purified. So this is an interesting one to unpack a little bit because the negative karma that you caused other sentient beings to collect. So we don't make anyone do anything, but we are a powerful influence, aren't we? We're a powerful condition. And it might be that your friend has a gossipy tendency, but if they hadn't met you that day, they wouldn't be gossiping, right? So you facilitated their accumulation of negative karma. So we also want to purify having been a negative condition for people when we've kind of like brought down the vibe of the room, when we've um, kind of brought out negative qualities in people and fed them. So we want to make sure that we're not getting all enmeshed and entangled and codependent. People still have responsibility for their own actions of body, speech, and mind. But what we're trying to acknowledge as someone who is an aspiring bodhisattva is that we can't just leave it at that, that it's their responsibility how they respond. We need to realize that we are a condition so we can bring out the best in people or the worst in people. And we need to really consciously see how can we bring out the best in them and, and purify when we know that we've been a condition for their negativity. You know what I mean? So just having that really awareness of don't get all tangled with it and feel like you're making anyone do anything or that everything's your fault or something. People still have responsibility for themselves and yeah. Intellectually easy, practicing difficult. <laughs> okay. So then we have glorious one, totally subduing, which purifies subtle negative karmas to do with slander. Galsup J says causing others to create negative karma is purified. So similar to the previous one, slander is, um, you know, is something that we really want to be aware of. So usually slander is considered lying about somebody to ruin their reputation. And that's obviously very negative. But we also might engage in like divisive speech, which could be sometimes telling the truth about someone in order for the other person to not like them anymore. So whether it's coming from accuracy and honesty, or whether it's coming from lying, um, we need to really be careful how we speak about each other. It's, it's, a, it's another one of those delicate ones where sometimes you need to alert friends and family that a certain person is doing negative things in order to protect the vulnerable. But sometimes we take the kind of permission to do that, and then we tell everyone. <laughs> Right. And it's like, let it be contained, like be, be the mature one, be the grown up one, be the bigger one that says, how about I just share the information that needs to be shared exactly in the context that it's needed, and not then use that as an opportunity to create a lot of drama. You know, so it's, it's just managing that, you know, because I think sometimes maybe say a workplace situation where there's a bully at work. And you feel like, you know, duty of care issues are rising, like you want to make sure this person isn't doing that anymore. You might have to tell a few people to try and figure out a strategy to stop that person's bullying behavior. But then having given yourself permission to do that, then you might tell all of your friends and all of your family and everyone, you know, that's what you're talking about that week is just what a horrible coworker they are and how much they bully. Do you know what I mean? It's like you did sort of from a practitioner perspective, have permission to tell certain people to strategize. How do we stop this behavior? How do we find out what's going on for them? But then you start telling everyone because it's just a fun drama. And that's what you're talking about that week, that month, that year. So we just want to like be careful. Yeah. 
utterly victorious in battle. So of course, whenever you hear um, conquering and battle and victories and all these kind of war terms, remember it's triumph over negative states of mind, right? It's not against people. So Gelsip J says, by reciting this name purifies all delusions. And Dhammabhadra says it purifies the negative karma collected with pride. By reciting this name, the negative karmas of rejoicing in others doing negative karma are purified. For example, rejoicing when there is a war. Let's say that a Tibetan person rejoices when he hears that a hundred Chinese soldiers have been killed in a war. That person gets the same heavy negative karma as if he had killed those hundred human beings. That is a powerful statement and something that we want to examine a little bit. So maybe you've heard how Lama Zopa Rinpoche emphasizes the practice of rejoicing as a way of making your positive karma bigger, greater, more profound. So you see someone doing a good thing, right? A charitable thing or a spiritual practice thing. And you just think very strongly, I'm so glad they're doing that. I so appreciate that they're doing that. I really rejoice that they're doing that. And you're like genuinely happy about their good action you get the same positive karma as them doing it. Amazing. So efficient. Same is true for negative karma, however. Yeah, we can't just say, oh, that only works for positive karma. No. So like I was thinking about, you remember years ago when um, Osama bin Laden was assassinated and like the whole like Western world was like, yes, we got him. Oh my God. The, the karma of that, like the karma of that. Now they all have killing karma. We might have been one of those people when we were watching the news. Oh, we got him. Oh my God, purify that today. You know, purify that today. We don't want to be rejoicing in other people's negative karma. You could think, I wonder if that action will help stop the momentum of people who are engaging in terrorist organizations. Let's see, with a kind of quiet, rational, objective mind, was that an action that had any aspect of maybe leading to the good? Probably not, but you know, you're kind of like, let's see what happens. But if you're thinking, oh good, we killed someone, that is really heavy negative karma. So remember that it goes both ways, right? Appreciating and enjoying and rejoicing in someone's good actions, you get similar or the same merit. Rejoicing and celebrating in someone's bad actions, you get similar or same negative karma as them. How, do, how does that sit with you? Or what does that bring up for you? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. <clears throat> I'm thinking of today's, you know, what's happening in the world today, you know, and it's very, uh, uh, and I've heard it many times, you know, it's better that he was bumped off or, you know. Um, so practicing Tonglen, you know, like um, I find is useful during those during those times, you know, and trying not to get involved in that conversation, which is so prevalent today, yeah. you know. Uh, and it's when you're with a group of people, it's it's, it's really difficult to stand out or stand away from the um the trend yeah so sometimes in my mind i mean in my mind i just practice you know that that tong tonglen you know yeah. to kai and yeah yeah that's a really skillful way <laughs> and it also helps focus doesn't it you know so yeah. everyone's ranting about politics you're just doing your tongue practice quietly in your mind and it helps you not get hooked into the drama or adding the drama that's a really skillful way yeah we should we should all do that that is excellent because sometimes it's you can't not, the conversation right yeah sometimes it's not that easy because you're thinking of you know the number of children that are being killed and you know yeah. they're and, and saying well they created the causes and conditions for those right. things to happen. And it sometimes doesn't sit well, you know, because you think yeah. of babies and, and it, yeah, and just have to kind of push through the, what you see, you know, and understand the bigger picture. Yeah. And it's not always that easy. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, and, you know, when you're seeing like harm of the innocent, 
you're not thinking that they created the cause in this life mm. and you're not mm. thinking they yeah. deserve it and you're not thinking exactly. it should happen you know you're mm. thinking somewhere in their past life they were yeah. the perpetrator and right now they look like a fresh clean thing that's brand new but actually they're a little ticking time bomb full of their own karma it's just right now they haven't done anything wrong and don't deserve anything bad mm-hmm. to ever happen to them but way back way back mm-hmm. we've all been the perpetrator we've all been the victim countless times you know and so it's it's delicate with karma because you know when bad things happen it's karma ripening but that doesn't mean it should right and that doesn't mean it has to and that doesn't mean it's fated to. We, we keep bringing in sometimes our Judeo-Christian stuff about the God stuff, like we're being rewarded or punished. And it's not that. It's just cause and effect. And we can prevent the suffering from coming by purifying. Okay. But, you know, when you see terrible mm. things in the world, <laughs> it's important to remember the longevity of karma and to take away ideas of like, they deserve it. No, they created the cause for it, but not right now. You know, right now they're an the innocent baby and nothing should ever bad happen to them. You know, nothing bad should ever happen to anyone, even if they created the cause for it. Just because the seed's there doesn't mean the seed mm-hmm. should sprout. It means the seed could sprout. Mm-hmm. And so let's not be a condition for people's negative karma to sprout. You know, that's that's really mm-hmm. the answer there. <clears throat> Yeah, Tong Lam. <laughs> yeah, Terry, go ahead. My husband, who is a wonderful man, I mean, he truly is a wonderful man, um, does have the habit of rejoicing when things happen in politics that, that are more to actually both of our preferences. And it's I find it challenging to to be there in an intimate relationship with him and, and to not promote his negative karma at that point in time. So I'm just wondering if you have any advice. You no, know, it's so interesting because you were talking about um, killing karma and my mind went immediately where yours did because he actually, when Osama bin Laden was killed, he did not create the cartoon, but he promoted it and sent it around, was actually yeah. making fun yeah. of the situation. And, you know, I objected um, but I mean, I, I do the same thing. I don't mean that I'm perfect by any means, but I do have a hard time keeping my seat when mm. he's engaging in that. And I don't want to promote his negative karma. Yeah. And, and we only have a certain amount of control and, you know, people got to follow their own path. But, but I think what we can do is have a really solid certainty about our stance our individual stance. So say, um, you know, something bad happened to something, you know, that we wanted to be stopped, you know, like, I don't know, say that somebody, you know, I don't know, I don't want to get too specific about politics, because we might not agree about our politics. But you know, say, say the bad guys got their comeuppance, (laughs) in whatever context, right, the bad guys, whoever they are, got their comeuppance. What we want our inner stance to be is, I'm happy if harm is being prevented but I'm not happy that the harmers got harmed. And just that stance, I'm happy that the harm was prevented or stopped or delayed, but I'm not happy that the harmers got harmed. And if that is our go-to stance, then when we're in a group situation, I think we can speak from that place without judgment and criticism of the other people. It's almost like when you have a window to elevate the conversation, you can nudge it that way. But when there's no window, when you know people are going to believe what they're going to believe and they're on a roll, you just kind of let go and drift to the back. But occasionally, you know, there is that like tiny window where someone's like, ha ha, that happened. And you're like, yeah, I hope the harm is prevented from that. And sometimes it can turn it by you framing it in that clearer, more elevated ethical way that can turn the whole conversation if you catch the window. But don't beat yourself up if you don't. And don't beat yourself up if you slide into it. Just, you know, purify right away because we don't want these things to get a head of steam. Yeah. And thank you, 35 Buddhas, <laughs> for helping us purify that. Then we have uh, glorious transcendence through subduing. So glorious transcendence through subduing purifies the negative karma collected by slandering others. 
as well as causing others to create negative karma. So these ones are quite similar, aren't they? A lot about slander and a lot about us having been a condition for people to do the wrong thing. Glorious manifestations illuminating all, having caused others to engage in negative karma and rejoicing when others create negative karma. So if you're really, you know, you went to town on a political rant, this row is really going to help sort you out karmically and purify that. Then all subduing Jew Lotus, you purify the very heavy negative karma of having abandoned the Holy Dharma, which means losing all respect for and reliance on any of the Buddha's teachings. For example, say that because you don't understand a teaching you've heard, you reject it, thinking the fault lies with the teaching rather than your lack of understanding. Okay, so abandoning the Dharma is not having a disagreement with the Dharma. You can have a disagreement. You can have a doubt, you can have a debate. In fact, you should, okay? Abandoning the Holy Dharma is saying, this is a load of rubbish, you know, F this, tossing it out, um, really having like an aggressively separating mind, like you're breaking up with the Dharma. <laughs> yeah, you've decided to break up with the Dharma, you know, kind of like with a humph, good riddance. Yeah, abandoning the Holy Dharma is, is gonna delay our progress. It's going to delay our progress. The Dharma is not going to come and punish us. No, the Buddhas are not going to come and punish us. No, they will never give up on you. No matter how messy you get, they will never give up on you. You can never ruin your Buddha nature. Never. It can't be ruined. It's the nature of your mind to be able to develop. So holding that, think there are people I have strong karmic connection with now who might only ever hear the spiritual path from me. The Buddha could be in front of them, perfect and pure, explaining things perfectly, and they wouldn't have the karma to see him or the, to understand him or to be connected to him necessarily. But they know me. They like me. So maybe if I get my act together, I'm going to help them connect to a spiritual path. So I don't want to abandon the Dharma when it gets hard. When it gets hard, I either need to push pause and have some space or study more, or ask some more questions, or have some debates. But I'm not going to say, it's hard, I don't want to, with like a really aggressive flick like that. Yeah, you can say, it's hard, I need a minute. Or I'm not sure how that could be true, or why that could be true. That disturbs my mind. I'm not going to take it on board necessarily. Let's leave that in ambiguity for a minute. That's fine. But it's that aggressive, like, no. Nah. Yeah. So abandoning the Holy Dharma is incredibly negative and maybe on a bad day, even in this life we have. So thank goodness there's a way to purify that. Yeah. Then the last one is King Lord of the Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus. And you'll notice even when we recite the 35 Buddhas, just one name each, this one we repeat three times because it's particularly emphasized by Lama Zopa Rinpoche. This one purifies the negative karma of having criticized the guru. It also purifies degenerated Samaya vows. It's a good idea to recite this Buddha's name three times. As criticizing the guru is the heaviest negative karma and something that happens very easily, if you can recite a mala of this name, it is excellent. Okay, so why is criticizing the guru the heaviest negative karma? Let's unpack that. Why is criticizing the guru the heaviest negative karma? seems a little fundamentalist, seems a little culty, yes? Or if it doesn't, it should for a minute feel that way. Like we should have some reaction to that statement probably if we're engaging our rational mind, yeah. To go, what do you mean don't criticize the guru? Don't they love a debate? What do you mean don't criticize the guru? How is that the heaviest negative karma? What if I killed someone? Do you, Are you having these doubts or am I giving you these doubts? <laughs> right? Have these doubts? Um, why do you think it said that? Why do you think that criticizing is the heaviest? Criticizing the guru is the heaviest. Why do you think? I would just think because they're the doorway for us personally to keep moving on the path because we have a connection together. Yeah. 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 Along those lines, for sure. Along those lines, for sure. It's like you just smashed the gateway. Yeah. Or smashed the doorway. 
And we're not necessarily even talking about one guru, you know, we can be talking about one guru, but it's kind of like, if you're, I guess, if you take a really simple example, like say you're a snotty teenager at school and you think you know everything, if you think you know everything, then you're going to find reasons to pick apart what every single teacher says, even if the teachers are really excellent, competent, loving teachers. If you're just in that mood of, I already know everything, how can you possibly progress? Yeah. So, and if you're, you know, thinking I already know everything and criticizing, then you're creating dissonance in the relationship. So even if you later think, oh, maybe I don't know everything. Now you're awkward and weird to approach the teacher and say, actually, I'm listening now. Like our ego and our pride and all of this weirdness gets all tangled up because we had such a critical attitude. Now we're kind of like, eh. it's, you know, it's done something to the relationship from our side, not from their side. From their side, they're, they're going to keep the light on for us forever. Yeah. But from our side, it's like, yeah, you've broken the doorway or you've, you know, kicked down the door and created all these obstacles for yourself to be able to progress. And when we're talking about the guru in Buddhism, remember like also the vast guru-ness concept of like anything that can teach you anything. Your kindergarten teacher teaching you the alphabet, your mom teaching you red, green, blue, you know, when you were a little kid, you know, your dad teaching you how to ride a bike, all of that teacher-ness energy, which was someone else's skill and ability meeting your potential and receptivity. Those two meetings of minds is the source of everything positive on the spiritual path. Yeah, someone's skill and ability meeting your receptivity and potential. That meeting is what we need in a countless contexts, not just the spiritual path, right? In the secular world, everywhere. So if you're kind of closing down that connection, that is heavy. Does it somehow make some sense? Closing down the connection. So it's not to say criticizing the guru can't be done. It's that type of criticism where you just shut down. Yeah, because there's even, you know, different, um, uh, I guess, it, when we're talking about the Vinaya or we're talking about ethics, if the guru is doing something that seems to be unethical, you're supposed to say, please explain. <laughs> yeah, what? Or if they ask you to do something unethical, you just say, no. Right? like we don't have to get weird about it if it's a real live flesh and blood person in front of you who is saying something that doesn't seem to accord with the dharma but you've otherwise taken them as a guru criticize in the sense of question not criticize in the sense of put down yeah so we're just trying to hear this from the right perspective and countless commentaries say, please do question your teachers. And if your teachers are doing some aspect of negative behavior, you can always criticize a behavior. Not necessarily the person, right? It's a different thing, but the behavior. And then when you get into Tantra, it gets more delicate because the relationship with the teacher is a Samaya bond. And that is until the end of time. And that is epic. And so if you're criticizing the Vajra guru, make sure it's really, really just a critical question to find truth, not at all a putting down. If there's any hint of the putting down, it should only land on a behavior, not on a person, if you've created that Samaya bond. So it's difficult, you know, because there's a lot of stuff out there these days about various teachers um, showing the aspect of some really problematic behavior there is no problem saying a behavior is problematic. We just don't want to attribute motive. We don't know why anyone does anything, but we can say that is not an ethical behavior that shouldn't happen without saying, and they are bad. You know, just say that is an unethical behavior that shouldn't happen. You can say that. So I'm, you know, spending some time with that one because, uh, you know, it's very much in the Buddhist world these days that this conversation and being able to distinguish between what conversations are appropriate and what conversations are inappropriate and what lines of reasoning internally are going to facilitate your growth and which ones are going to stagnate your growth. These are really important inner conversations to have. 
because I think people get paralyzed and don't know how to talk about the guru when something weird is happening. Yeah, they don't know what to say, what to do. So they just kind of freeze and disassociate. Or they rage and leave the whole dharma behind. Or they go into a depression and they just kind of fall into a puddle of complacency. Like weird stuff happens if we don't know how to pull these things apart when weird stuff happens, which will continue to happen. It's the degenerate age. It's going to be harder and harder for us to find gurus with the appearance and behavior of pure ethics. It's going to be harder until Maitreya comes because we're in a slumpy period. Yeah. Yeah. It, thoughts on that or questions on that? I'm talking too much, but we have a, a, um, a group in our small town that is not in line with the Dalai Lama, you know, and um, that causes quite a bit of um, discontentment, really, and query and um, from public, you know, from people asking, not that I... Pr profess I'm a Buddhist to many people but you know um it yeah I just don't know it's sometimes it's difficult to manage that because people mm. don't understand they see Buddhism yeah. like Christianity they, I try to explain it as as many types of Christianity as there are Buddhism as there are Buddhists you know but it's very difficult you know so if you comment you've got to comment um yeah I mean the, the easiest way to frame it for people that are not in our Buddhist world and are missing our context is to just say, that's a fundamentalist branch. Right. Fundamentalism makes any religion weird. Fundamentalist yeah. Christians get weird. Fundamentalist Muslims get weird. Fundamentalist Buddhists get weird. Fundamentalism is not the religion that they promote. You know, it's an extremist view that is too black and white. It misses nuance. It becomes glassy eyed fanaticism. So it's not really Buddhism. It's just a fundamentalist it, extremist brand. If you frame it in that way, you don't have yeah. to go into details of what makes them fundamentalist unless no. they act. then you can go into those details. But usually that's enough for the people to go, oh, OK, they're fundamentalists. Mm. Bless them. <laughs> right we'll just kind of wish them well and put our focus elsewhere you know yeah thank you thank yeah. you it's clear yeah um, other thoughts about this um this last of the 35 buddhas that purifies criticizing the guru and the whole concept yeah Aaron, go ahead um yeah i feel like i'm talking too much too but i'm really curious so i i notice one of the things that i've been working on for years now is I, I have this criticizing undercurrent, which I am really not proud of at all. And um, I noticed that I just kind of do it all the time. So when I go to teachings, I'm also doing it when I'm receiving teachings. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking what I just picked up here maybe is that after I go to a teaching, I could just grab my mala and do a mala of this, um, yeah. this yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good solution. And, and I mean, as with the, like any habit, there's a difference between it arising and you indulging in it, right? So if you have like a random critical thought, just go, oh yeah, there's one of those, let it die a natural death. That's not as heavy a karma is, is the thought of criticism comes up and then you feed it and indulge it and go on a whole story with it. So if it just arises, don't give it too much attention. It's just an old habit. Don't punish yourself for it. Don't suppress it. Don't indulge it. Don't talk to yourself about it. Just go, oh yeah, one of those. Let it die. It, it will die if you don't feed it. And it might take maybe a year, maybe two or something of just like sitting in teachings like always. The criticism rises. You notice it. You don't feed it. It passes. And, and sometimes when you're in a pure environment or a so-called pure environment, there's a lot of holy objects, there's a lot of practitioners, there's a teacher teaching Dharma. What can happen is kind of like a healing crisis where all the glunk that's just been kind of sitting there under the surface, not causing any trouble, kind of gets blasted to the surface. So also like you can be worse than usual in this beautiful idyllic setting. You're like, what is wrong with me? This is my favorite thing. And now I'm just grumpy as hell. What is happening? And actually that can be um, not terrible if you don't feed it. Just be like, oh, here we go, <laughs> right? It's like, it's just bringing everything up. So if it brings everything up, that's maybe not even the worst thing either. It's just don't give in. Don't give in to that train of thought. Go, yeah, I see you and I'm listening. 
yep critical thought i hear you listening you know just keep coming back as if it was a meditation right and you're meditating on the breath and then you have a distraction you go oh yeah distraction anyway breath you know what what can happen is the story around it more than the thing that arises itself because we'll think all number of rubbish like we have weird random stuff in there that will come up like don't worry about it just don't give it energy you know you also don't want to disassociate from it and pretend it's not there but you know that like that line Yes, thank you for your candor. <laughs> you are not alone. <laughs> so I didn't expect to be talking, <laughs> but <laughs> um, this is something that um, I get down on myself for. And I just realized that, I mean, I, I recognize it as a habit. And um, there's something, something else that I relate to it. So um, I've done a lot of work with my body in terms of um, trying to let go of, let's say, gates that aren't correct, you know, not useful to me or, or the, just a use, use of my body that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And instead of telling myself, don't do such and such, I find it so much more helpful to say, this is what I could do, or this is what it would feel like if I did it a different way. Yeah. And so when I, especially with the Dharma, when I first started, it was don't do this and don't do that. And um, <laughs> this is bad. And this is worse. And, and, and I just really resisted all of that. And so how I, I deal with this or try to deal with it, um, and maybe in this new context, is to find out the way in which I can deal with it or the mm. way I can look at it, which is a positive way. And then we're always so much more attracted to the positive. Yeah. That if I can remember the positive, then the, the habit won't bother me so much. Yeah, that's a good framing. That's a really good framing. And even just like visualize what would it look like differently? You know, this arises, what's the best way I can manage it next time and kind of, you know, follow the good storyline before you're even there and say, okay, the next time I have those critical thoughts about my fellow members of the community, I'm going to think, oh, what perfect mirrors they are to show me myself. How embarrassing. Thank you, friends. <laughs> right. And the next time I'm feeling, you know, whatever criticism towards the teacher, I'll think, oh, wow, I'm just like a, a teenager whose kids, her, whose parents have just gotten divorced. And I'm like, you're not my real dad. You're not saying it right. You know, like how funny that I still have that tiny little whatever mm. person that's just, you're not doing it the way I like, you know, like how childish. How about next time I laugh at myself and it opens mm. my heart rather than closes it or whatever, you know. But yeah, I think to focus the positive is a really skillful way. Thank you for that. Well, I'm not saying that I actually can do that, but I'm aspiring to do that. Yeah, um, what a good day. I, I think just recognizing that I'm reacting negatively to the habit is is always <sighs> like the first step. Absolutely. And anytime you have mental space with the rubbish that comes up, it's a, it's a triumph. You know, because that means you can choose whether to believe it or not. You can choose whether to go with it or not. It's when it just has such a strong head of steam that you're in the flow with it for ages before you even realize how negative it is that it's it's worse. <laughs> you know, so if you even just notice yourself doing it is amazing. Yeah, we have a lot of those habits pretty hardwired. So now we're going to just do a short journal on um, the related energy of Amoga City, um, which is looking at jealousy. So in the journal, just again, thinking physically, verbally, mentally, how does your own personal expression and habit of jealousy manifest? That mind that compares, that mind that's why do they get that, that mind, how is it? Like, what are the physical behaviors of that? What is your speech like when it's driving you? And what is your mentality of jealousy? So we'll just do um, 15 minutes on jealousy and, um, and then shift gears. And go ahead and wrap up the thought that you're on. So jealousy, how's that? <laughs> um, so physically or verbally or mentally, what does it feel like? How can you catch that that's the one that's driving? 
what is jealousy like? Yeah, I think for me, I, I, I'm most aware of it coming when I start to compare myself with somebody else. And it, and I think the basis of it, it can be kind of a low self-esteem or a feeling of insufficiency. Mm. Not really nice. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's awful. It's an awful feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Fortunately, I'm a little bit older and I probably do it a little bit less than I did before. Or I learned that it's not very <laughs> constructive. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it's kind of like with the five main delusions that we've been talking about. There's probably one that we default to when we're tired, when we're stressed, when things aren't going our way, we might kind of default attachment or default anger, you know, or default whatever. But I think that um, when we're around other people, it's also interesting to see, is it the same default or is it different? Like, do we have a different delusion when we're all by ourselves? Like, if we're all by ourselves full of angst and melancholy, do we kind of revert to attachment? But when we're with people, we kind of go into jealousy or, you know, pride or what happens? Is it the same? Is it different? Kind of an interesting exploration. But yeah, I think you're right. The, the root is some weird comparison thing. Yeah. And uh, there's sometimes little elements of how come they got that? I deserve that. Yeah. Or how come they got that? I must be bad because I don't, you know, it can go kind of either way, but it's that unfortunate comparison, not knowing the full story of anyone's karma or life, or even how they're responding to the beauties and joys that you're so jealous of. But yeah, it's a, it's an affliction. That's for sure. Yeah. Other ways of catching it. Um, does anything happen with your verbal choices does anything happen in your physicality that would kind of indicate to you jealousy is present <laughs> um I was too, i'm still talking too much um I, I think in my body i feel hot it makes me feel hot mm. you know and um like the other lovely lady said just a minute ago as you get older the jealousy seems to it's not so much you know being jealous mm. of other people I think for me at the moment, what I feel really jealous about is my lack of independence. Mm. You know, I'm jealous of those that can get up and walk. Yeah. You know, I'm jealous of those that can take their car keys and get in their car and go where they want to go. Yeah. And um, and then that translates into I feel pissed or pissed off. Excuse yeah. the expression. I get a little, you know, and think. And then my mouth runs away with me. Yeah. So I have to watch my mouth. You know, the horse is bolted before I can shut the gate. And yep. I find that as I get older, I have less, my inhibitions, you know, they're, they're gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't care anymore what other people think, you know. And, um, Both pros and cons to that. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. But it's a good lesson. It's a very good lesson to me. You know, when I feel a little bit more rational, sometimes, you know, I can look at the situation and think and be grateful for what I've got and be grateful mm -hmm. that I'm safe and that people around me that care about me. Yeah. Although, you know, sometimes I don't want them to care so much. You know, <laughs> it would. Be, <laughs> I don't want to be classed as an old lady. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. All the negative connotations. You're like, I will be yeah, the wild, yeah. sure, but I'm not going to be the yeah. sweet old deer. Thank you. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's uh, and it, 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 it in sense in my body is the sensation of heat. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It can almost be like a blush. Yeah. Or yeah. Like a, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah. Like blood <laughs> rising. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting how quickly it gets co-opted by other afflictions, right? So you have like the the jealousy and then, you know, the like, ah, youth is wasted on the young, <laughs> right? Mm. The classic, right? Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, and then it turns into why can't I attachment, attachment, and then attachment can't get it what it wants. So then anger. <laughs> and so it's yeah. like, who's the attachment anger? <laughs> mm. All friends. Yeah. Mm. But uh, which yeah, which one started the the whole horses off to the races, which was the launcher. Maybe sometimes it is 
it is jealousy. And, you know, you remember that uh, verse in eight verses of thought transformation where it says, when out of envy, others mistreat yeah. insults yes. of you like that one. Mm. It's always interesting to think when people are insulting, how often it comes from envy and jealousy. Yeah. And yeah. when we're insulting towards others or aggressive with our speech towards others, there often is an underlying envy, jealousy thing happening there that's kind of unacknowledged sometimes. So, you know, jealousy and pride go together a bit. Um, and there's all sorts of different kinds of jealousy, like comparing towards people you perceive as equal, comparing towards people you perceive as above, but not as above as they actually are. There's all sorts of weird comparisons happening with jealousy. Mm -hmm. And I think that your kind of go-to response being gratitude is really skillful in thinking about how do I practice contentment? How do I list the things that are going well? Because it feels so cheesy to do that sometimes, right? It feels mm -hmm. corny to be like, oh, here's what's going well in my life, you know, eye roll. But actually, if you can kind of make yourself do it, it can fill you up. So you don't feel the deprivation, which is fueling the jealousy. You know, jealousy has some sense of I'm being deprived or I don't have enough, you know? Mm. And so if you feel full, then jealousy doesn't have as much of a chance to get mm. in there. You know, so yeah, as you say, mm. beautiful, safe, idyllic New Zealand, <laughs> being grateful for that, you know, having mm. some love friends and family, having a, a sharp mind, having a quick wit, having learned the lessons of your life, because it's true that a lot of things get better as you get older. But the small print is, if you learned your lessons well, some yeah, people don't, yeah. right? Some people become grumpier and more resentful and worse as they get older. That could happen to any of us. So just rejoicing that you aged in the way that led to wisdom, not in the way that led to despair, you know, mm. on a good day, right? On a good day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder about speech. You know, sometimes um, when we have jealousy in our mind, our speech gets a little bit passive aggressive, maybe like we're trying or like fishing for a compliment or sort of like subtly putting down the person that we're jealous of in a kind of like half praising them, but half kind of belittling them kind of, you know, someone will say, oh, isn't it beautiful? What a wonderful marriage those two have and you're jealous of their marriage. And so you go, oh yeah, you know, they're, they're so cute together. You should hear them at night though. When I walk by, I can hear them arguing. You know, it's like, there's that little like resentment creeps in, you know, mm. and you're sort of half, half praising, half putting them down because actually you're jealous. I'm like, oh, isn't it wonderful? So-and-so got that new job and that promotion. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he knew the boss, you know, that mm -hmm. is our words do. That's always an interesting indicator. Um, some people who are polite when they have jealousy, they just kind of go silent and frozen when that's been triggered. They don't say anything. They're just like, hmm someone they don't like is being praised or something they're jealous of is being praised. And they're like, hmm. <laughs> right. So, so just kind of like catching, like, what does it look like for us as an individual? That means you can name it and it will die a natural death. If you, if you can't catch what's going on for you, it just becomes how you are. And then how you are is suffering more and causing more trouble and needs more purification. So, so much is prevented by just having the mindfulness that's conditioned by study and the mindfulness that's conditioned by deep reflection. So that when you're mindful, you're like, I'm not just aware of what's arising. I'm able to name it and, you know, let it go. Because it's not enough to just be mindful. We have to have mindfulness with an agenda. I find that um, when I am jealous of someone, which I don't catch very often, um, but I have found that if it happens with the same person more, you know, more often, that um, if I make an effort to get to really know them mm. um, in a way that I like them, then I can turn it a bit to rejoicing. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, how I've worked with it a little bit. I don't yeah, often that's, that's catch. Really cool. yeah. Um, 
So. Yeah, and trying to find something likable about everyone, that's a good practice in general, and it does kind of prevent a lot of those afflictions, jealousy, and the rest of them, if you can kind of practice, how do I feel fondness for the human race? How do I just generally feel fondness for the human race, plus these individuals in my everyday life, how do I feel a genuine warmth towards them? Because it's interesting when you feel warmth, then the things they do that are out of sync with the norm or when they're something you wouldn't expect or prefer, then they become like eccentric idiosyncrasies that you find sort of humorous and endearing. But if you don't like them, they're just aggravating traits and you wish they would stop and bugger off. You know, but it's like if you have warmth towards them, then their little oddities or things they do that aren't what you would do, you just kind of feel them sort of sweet. You're like, oh, that's funny how they do that. That's so sweet, you know, or like, yeah, something eccentric or something. It's like, how do you find genuine appeal in the human race? And and of course, that's where you get the teachings on bodhicitta and the sevenfold cause and effect, where you start by seeing all sentient beings as having been your mother in the past. But that means you have to have a sense of archetypal mother and the kind of unconditional kindness archetypal mother would have given and think every single sentient being has done that for me. Every single sentient being has wiped my bum, has cleaned up my vomit, has protected me when I was fragile, has fed me from her own body. Every sentient being has done that for me. It gives you this attitude of just incredible respect and gratitude if you do it right. You know, but it, it's hard to get yourself into that framework where you want to repay the kindness, but you don't feel like obliged and then resentful. Yeah, John, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, sometimes you learn about somebody and they they turn out to be even more wonderful than you thought. And yeah. That, that, you may be even more jealous of them. <laughs> so they're like, oh, they have all these wonderful things and they're really nice. <laughs> right <laughs> oh man <laughs> yeah it's true you're trying to find holes in the story so you could be like oh sure that's going well but look at that oh no everything's going well <sighs> right yeah and I mean I think that the, the way of framing it is to think more like objectively about they're showing us what's possible for the human condition and what happens when merit is aligned and ripening so rather than think oh man they have everything Ugh. you know uh, and here you feel your own struggle even worse you think actually they're showing me what's possible and my future will have elements of that and the question becomes when i am reborn in an idyllic way with all the conditions complete will I remember to practice? Yeah. Or will I be like a God realm being who just enjoys the pleasure and gets lost in it and never develops on the path? So sometimes I think of the hardships in my, my life or the hardships in my health or whatever hardships as things I'm so grateful for, because otherwise I would be complacent. Otherwise I would just, my life would just race by and what was it all for? So sometimes when it's like everyone's got everything together, also asking, and are they practicing? Do they have the impetus to practice? Is there a depth of understanding of universal suffering? Or is there a bit of separation from that? You know, would I have the compassion that I have if I hadn't been as hurt as badly as I'd been hurt? You know, so, so also just thinking like, what are we choosing to be jealous of? You know, that's kind of... Um, something worth exploring because we assume that those conditions for happiness are things that we want but are they things we ultimately want if we want to progress on a spiritual path we need enough happiness to keep going but also enough suffering to kind of kick us in the bum and make us motivated you know so sometimes you can frame it that way but i always think about like um you know, Hollywood movie stars, how often they turn to drugs and alcohol and have multiple divorces. And it's kind of like if beauty, wealth, and status equaled happiness, they would be happy, but they're not. There's a couple of them that seem to have figured it out, but most of them have some sort of deep angst. And then there's that fear of losing that beauty, power, status, whatever. All that fear of what'll happen when I get old. What'll happen if I, you know, have a, a dud, 
<laughs> you know, the next film. So there's also that pressure on people who have it all to keep it. So some different angles, yeah. But yeah, it's always funny when that happens and you find out more about them and you think, well, you're great. <laughs> yeah, totally. Keep a sense of humor, it'll save everything. <laughs> so we're gonna do the last row, which is the medicine Buddhas. And I thought rather than go through them and their qualities, because um, I covered that fairly thoroughly in the class. And so if you wanna look it up, you can look up the class or you can read in the book. I thought we would do it in the form of a prayer. So there's a prayer for each of the medicine Buddhas, which shows what they emphasize. And so it's more a practice orientation than like a school orientation like we've been doing earlier. So I'll just briefly introduce them and then we'll do the prayers to the medicine Buddhas, which is just from the puja and, um, and then go into our Vajrasattva practice. Okay. The sixth row is the medicine Buddhas and Shakyamuni Buddha who purify and protect beings of the degenerate age. So they're not officially part of the 35 Buddhas, but our tradition adds them on because of this particular quality they have to help beings during this time. So a degenerate age is the time after a fully enlightened Buddha has shown the aspect of passing away. So there's Buddhas everywhere all the time. We're not like running out of Buddhas, but Shakyamuni Buddha, had the karmic connection with sentient beings and the sentient beings had the merit to see him in his fully fledged form and for him to teach the entire path to enlightenment. And then he showed the aspect of dying and the time after that merit is kind of waning for sentient beings. Um, so during this time, delusions are stronger and harder to abandon. The degeneration of sentient beings means they are more thick-skulled and difficult to subdue. The degeneration of time means there are more wars, sicknesses with new diseases coming. The degeneration of life means that lifespan is becoming shorter. And the degeneration of views means that people very easily believe wrong views and feel it difficult to believe the right view. And only a small number of people believe in karma or understand ethics. So I think we can see this playing out. And all of this feels kind of heavy, but remember it's not forever. That there's a dark age and then there's a renaissance and then there's a dark age and then there's a renaissance. But also remember that even during this dark age period that we're into, there is great opportunity for practice. And there are even Buddhas who particularly directed their attention to support us during that time. So with that idea, We'll do the prayers to the seven medicine Buddhas. So if you feel comfortable reciting aloud but staying muted, do so. But if you just like to listen, that's okay too. Medicine Buddha, renowned, glorious, king of excellent signs, may all sentient beings, such as ourselves, be freed from epidemics, execution, criminals, and spirits, have faculties fully complete have the continuum of suffering and negativities cut, not fall to lower realms, and experience the happiness of humans and gods. With hunger, thirst, and poverty pacified, may there be wealth. Without torments of body, such as bindings and beatings, without harm of tigers, lions, and snakes, with conflict pacified, endowed with loving minds, and relieved from fear of flood as well, May we pass to fearless bliss. So imagine light coming from the heart of renowned glorious king of excellent signs, flowing to you and absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech and mind. Medicine Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon, and lotus. May we have wealth and goods of humans and gods. Without torment and conception, be always born human. Never be separated from bodhicitta. Increase in virtuous dharma. Purify obscurations. 
gain the happiness of humans and gods. May we be freed from being separated from the spiritual guide, from dark ages, spirit harm, death and enemies, and from the dangers of isolated places. May we have enthusiasm for making offerings and rituals. May lesser beings have samadhi, mindfulness, strength the Durrani of non-forgetfulness and attain supreme wisdom. May tormenting fires be cooled. And from King of Melodious Sound, brilliant radiance of skill adorned with jewels, moon and lotus's heart, comes radiant nectar flowing to you, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech and mind. Medicine Buddha, stainless, excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows. For all sentient beings such as ourselves, may the short-lived gain longevity, the poor full wealth. May combatants come to have loving minds. May we, be, may we not be without training and fall to the lower realms, but be bound by our vows and never without bodhicitta. Light coming from the heart of Medicine Buddha, stainless, excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows, flowing into you, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. Medicine Buddha, supreme glory free from sorrow. For all sentient beings such as ourselves, may sorrow and the like always be pacified and life be long and happy. May the conqueror's light increase bliss and joy in the hells. May we have brightness, beauty, and wealth be unharmed by spirits. May we have love for each other and may there be no disease. Light coming from the heart of Medicine Buddha, supreme glory free from sorrow, pouring into you, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. Medicine Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma. For all sentient beings such as ourselves, may we always have perfect view and faith. Hear the sound of Dharma and be enriched with bodhicitta. For the sake of resources, may we give up negativities, may wealth increase, may we abide in love, have long lives, and be content. Light radiating from the heart of Medicine Buddha Melodious Ocean of Proclaimed Dharma, filling you, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind.
Medicine Buddha, delightful king of clear knowing, supreme wisdom of an ocean of dharma, mind of profound dharma wisdom difficult to fathom, sporting in the pure sphere of truth, one who sees all knowable objects directly I prostrate. For all sentient beings such as ourselves, may the distracted be free of malice and rich in goods. May those on evil paths to lower realms attain the ten virtues. May those controlled by others gain perfect independence and all here have long life, hear the names and be virtuous. Light flowing from delightful king of clear knowing, supreme wisdom of an ocean of dharma. From his heart into you, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech and mind. Medicine Buddha, King of Lapis, Sapphire Light, Bhagawan with equal compassion for all, whose name, when merely heard, dispels the suffering of lower realms, dispeller of disease and the three poisons I prostrate. May the light dispelling darkness, the enjoyment of wisdom, and skillful means be inexhaustible. May those attracted to mistaken and lesser paths enter the Mahayana and all be beautified by their vows. May we be free from pain caused by immorality, be complete in faculties and without disease, and have abundant goods. May those disillusioned with the weakest conditions always have powerful faculties, and may we be freed from Mara's noose and perverse viewpoints. May those tormented by kings gain bliss, and those who out of hunger support themselves through negativity be satisfied with food received in accordance with the Dharma. May hardships of heat and cold be pacified and all good wishes be fulfilled. Endowed with morality that pleases the Aryas, may we be liberated. Light flowing from the heart of Medicine Buddha, King of Lapis Light, into you, absorbing into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. Okay, so that's the whole set. And if we go back to the top of the image, we remember that we have Shakyamuni Buddha in the center with Chen Rezik at his heart. Then we have Kunrig who helps in the bardo, Namgelma who helps with long life, Veritana or Ekshobhya, purification of form, and then Vajrasattva, all-encompassing purification, which we'll do now as a practice. So just take a minute and revive your refuge, visualizing Vajrasattva above the crown of your head, facing the same direction as you, radiant white made of transparent light. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened, to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, by my merits of giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened, to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, by my merits from giving and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened, to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, by my merits from giving and other perfections, 
May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So stabilizing refuge in bodhicitta. And then we stabilize the image above the crown of our head, going through all the details. So visualize about four inches above your head is an open white lotus, upon which is a moon disk. All in the nature of light. Vajrasattva is seated upon this. His holy body is translucent white and adorned with the six ornaments and clothes of celestial silk. In his right hand is a Vajra, symbolic of great bliss. In his left hand is a bell, symbolic of the wisdom of emptiness. The Vajra and bell together signify his attainment of the enlightened state the inseparable unity of the wisdom and form bodies. At his heart is a moon disk with the seed syllable whom at its center and the letters of Vajrasattva's hundred syllable mantra standing clockwise around its edge. So having connected with refuge, now connect and associate that refuge with Vajrasattva above you holding as many details as you can, scanning up and down. And generating the power of regret, saying the prayer, the negative karma I have accumulated from beginningless time is as extensive as the ocean. Although I know that each negative action leads to countless eons of suffering, it seems that I'm constantly striving to create nothing but negative actions. Even though I try to avoid non-virtue and practice positive acts, day and night, without respite, Negativities and ethical downfalls come to me like rainfall. I lack the ability to purify these faults so that no trace of them remains. With these negative imprints in my mind, death will come suddenly and without warning. I could find myself falling to an unfortunate rebirth. My closest friend from a past life could be there suffering even now. I may, tor be, I may be tormented there myself by this time next year. What can I do? Please, Vajrasattva, with your great compassion, guide me from such misery. And so now we reflect on our past negative actions of body, speech, and mind and generate sincere regret without guilt or identification, taking responsibility and confessing before Vajrasattva's compassionate gaze. So starting with non-virtues of body, again, reflecting on past actions of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct, seeing a fault to be a fault.
and shift thinking about non-virtues of speech, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle gossip. Recently or in the past or both, really reflect on those habits of mind, those actions you've done. Seeing a fault to be a fault, genuine regret. And then shifting to looking at non-virtues of mind and spending some extra time with the mental faults. So just really looking at how the mind has been trending. Does it go in a covetousness way? Lots of attachment, lots of craving and hunger. Does it go in an ill will way related to hatred, anger? Are there a lot of wrong views, superstitions, ignorance, afflicted doubts? Just looking into each of those, thinking about when they've really taken hold, when you've given in to them, seeing faults to be faults.
covetousness and attachment can feel like clinging, craving, pulling towards energy. Ill will can feel like pushing away, aversion. Wrong views and ignorance can feel like disassociation or tangledness, cloudiness. Just really check in with those three. And think all of these non-virtues of body, speech, and mind that I've remembered, I lay bare, and I also lay bare everything I can't remember, but is assumed is the case. All of this before Vajrasattva's compassionate gaze. And from the whom at Vajrasattva's heart, light radiates in all directions, requesting the Buddhas to bestow their blessings. They accept the request and send white rays of light and nectar, the essence of which is the knowledge of their body, speech, and mind. The light and nectar absorb into the whom and the letters of the mantra at Vajrasattva's heart. They fill his whole body completely, enhancing the magnificence of his appearance and increasing the brilliance of the mantra at his heart until it shines with the light of 100,000 moons reflected by snowy mountains. And while we recite the mantra, rays of white light stream down continuously from the human mantra at Vajrasattva's heart. They flow down through the crown of your head and fill every cell of your body and mind with infinite bliss. Your disturbing attitudes and negativities in general, particularly those of the body, take the form of black ink Sicknesses take the form of pus and blood. Afflictions caused by spirits appear in the form of scorpions, snakes, frogs, and crabs. Flushed out by the light and nectar, they all leave your body through the lower openings like filthy liquid flowing from a drain pipe. So with that visualization, we purify the body the mantra seven times. One Vajrasattva Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasattva Deno Padishta Dido Mebawa Suto Kayo Mebawa Supo Kayo Mebawa Anorakto Mebawa Sawa Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutsa Me Siddham Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Mutsa Vajra Bawa Mahasam Maya Sattva Ahum Pei. Om Vajrasattva Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasattva Deno Padisha Dido Mebawa Sutokayo Mebawa Supokayo Mebawa Anarakto Mebawa Sawa Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutta Me Siddham Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Mutsa Vajra Bawa Maha Samaya Sapa Ahum Pei Om Vajra Sapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sapa Deno Vari Shadiro Mebawa Sudokayo Mebawa Supokayo Mebawa 
Feel completely empty of these problems and negativities. They no longer exist anywhere. And we purify speech. Your disturbing attitudes and imprints of negativities of speech take the form of liquid tar. The light and nectar fill your body as water fills a dirty glass. The negativities like dirt rise to the top and flow out through the upper openings of your body, your eyes, ears, mouth, nose, etc. Adding the mantra. Om Vajrasapa Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasapa Deno Padishta Dido Mebawa Sudokaya Mebawa Supokaya Mebawa Anarakta Mebawa Sava Sidi Me Prayatsa Sava Kama Sutsame Sidam Shriam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bagao Sava Tata Gata Vajra Mame Mutsa Vajra Bawa Mahasamaya Sapa Ahum Pe Om Vajrasapa Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasapa Deno Padishta Dido Me Bawa Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Supo Kaya Me Bawa Anarakta Me Bawa Sawa Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutta Me Siddham Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagam Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Mutsa Vajra Bawa Mahasamaya Sattva Ahum Pe Om Vajrasapa Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasapa Deno Padishta Dido Me Bawa Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Supo Kaya Me Bawa Anarakta Me Bawa Sawa Siddhi Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutta Nidam Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagao Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mami Vajra Bawa Mahasamaya Sapa Ahum Pe Om Vajrasapa Samaya Manupalaya Vajrasapa Deno Padisha Dido Me Bawa Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Supo Kaya Me Bawa Anarakta Me Bawa Sawa Siddhi Me Prayasa Sawa Kama Sutta Me Siddham Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagao 
Sawatara gata vaja mame mutsa vaja bawa maha samaya sapa ahum pe. On vaja sapa samaya manu palaya. Vaja sapa deno bari shadiro me bawa. Suto kaya me bawa. Supo kaya me bawa. Ano rakta me bawa. Sawa siri me prayatsa sawa kama sutsa me. Siram shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bagam. Sawa tata gata vaja mame mutsa vaja bawa maha samaya sapa ahum pe. Om vaja sapa samaya manu palaya. Vaja sapa deno bari shari rame bawa. Sudo kaya me bawa. Supo kaya me bawa. Ana rakta me bawa. Sawa siri me prayatsa sawa kama sutta me. Siram shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bagao. Sawa tata gata vaja mame muta vaja bawa mahasamaya sapa ahum pe. Om vaja sapa samaya manu palaya. Vaja sapa deno bari shadi rame bawa. Sudo kaya me bawa. Supo kaya me bawa. Ana rakta me bawa. Sawa siri me prayata sawa kama sutta me. Siram shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bagawa. Sawa tata gata vajra mame muta vajra bawa mahasamaya sapa ahum pe. Om vajra sapa samaya manu palaya. Vajra sapa deno bari shadi rame bawa. Sudo kaya me bawa. Supo kaya me bawa. Ana rakta me bawa. Sawa siri me prayata sawa kama sutta me. Siram shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bagao. Sawa tata gata vajra mame muta vajra bawa mahasamaya sapa ahum pe. Feel completely empty of these problems and negativities. They no longer exist anywhere. Your disturbing attitudes and the imprints of mental activities appear as darkness at your heart. As you recite the mantra, immeasurable and unimaginably powerful rays of white light and nectar pour down from Vajrasattva's heart and penetrate the crown of your head. When struck by this forceful stream of light and nectar, the darkness instantly vanishes. It is like turning on a light in a room. The darkness does not go anywhere. It simply ceases to exist. Holding that, adding the mantra. Om Vajrasapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vajrasapa Deno Parishna Dira Me Bawa Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Supo Kaya Me Bawa Anurakta Me Bawa Sawa Siri Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutta Me Siram Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Mutsa Vajra Bawa Maha Samaya Sapa Ahum Pe Om Vajra Sapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sapa Deno Parishna Dira Me Bawa Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Supo Kaya Me Bawa Anurakta Me Bawa Sawa Siri Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutta Me Siddham Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Muta Vajra Bawa Maha Samaya Sapa Ahum Pe Om Vajra Sapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sapa Deno Bari Shari Rame Bawa Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Supo Kaya Me Bawa Ano Rakta Me Bawa Sawa Siri Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Suktam Siram Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagao Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Muta Vajra Bawa Maha Samaya Sapa Ahum Pe Om Vajra Sapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sapa Deno Bari Shari Rame Bao Sudo Kaya Me Bawa Subo Kaya Me Bao Ano Rakta Me Bawa Sawa Siri Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Suktam Siram Shriyam Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagawa Sawa Tata Gata Vajra Mame Muta Vajra Bawa Maha Samaya Sapa Ahum Pe Om Vajra Sapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vajra Sapa Deno Bari Shari Rame Bao Sudo Kaya Me Bao Supo Kaya Me Bao 
Ano rakta me bawa sawa siri me prayansa sawa kama sutsa me siram shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bhagam sawa tada gata vajra ma me muta vajra bawa maha samaya sapa ahum pe om vajra sapa samaya manu palaya vajra sapa deno parisha rira me bawa suro kaya me bawa suko kaya me bawa Anarakta me bawa sawa siri me prayatsa sawa kama sutsam sidam shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bhagawa sawa tata gata vajra mame muta vajra bawa mahasamaya sapa ahum pe om vajra sapa samaya manu balaya vajra sapa deno barishna dhiro me bawa sudo kaya me bawa sukho kaya me bawa Anarakta me bawa sawa siri me prayatsa sawa kama sutsa me siddham shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bhagam sawa tata gata vajra mame musa vajra bawa maha samaya sattva ahum pe. Feel that you are completely empty of all these problems. They are non-existent. Vajrasattva is extremely pleased and says, My spiritual child of the essence, all your negativities, obscurations, and degenerated vows have now been completely purified. And we say to him and to ourselves, I shall not create these negative actions from now until. And we vow never to commit again those actions from which we can easily abstain and not to commit for a day, an hour, or at least a few seconds, those negative actions from which you find it difficult to abstain. Thinking physically, verbally, and particularly mentally. Practical plans. Finishing up those plans, repeating them to yourself. And with delight, Vajrasattva melts into light and dissolves into you. Your body, speech, and mind become inseparably one with Vajrasattva's holy body, speech, and mind. Concentrate on this. In emptiness, there is no I, creator of negative karma. There is no action of creating negative karma. There is no negative karma created. With this awareness of emptiness, dedicate the merits. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of Vajrasattva, that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their sufferings. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. 
May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so we'll have a couple hours break for lunch, etc., or depending on your time zone, whatever you want to get up to, and I'll see you then. Thanks.